Grace and peace be with you from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be able to preach the gospel of God's grace to the Mosaic community on this Lord's Day. I'm very thankful for Pastor Slim and the opportunity he has granted me and the trust he has put in me to preach the word of God to you on this day. And it is my hope and my prayer that the word of God that we hear, the gospel of grace that we encounter will encourage our souls. And my prayer for you is that this message will inspire you and encourage you in your cross-cultural ministry in Waco and beyond. The story that you have just heard or read from Acts 21 tells about the Apostle Paul and part of his journey up to Jerusalem. In the context of the book of Acts, he has been traveling for quite some time, hundreds of miles by land and by sea, so that he can take a gift, an offering, a benevolence offering from Gentile or ethnic Christians all the way to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who were suffering. They were suffering because of famine. They were suffering because of job loss. They were suffering because many of them were in material need. And now we see the churches coming together over this mercy ministry. But it's not just about Paul delivering a benevolent gift to the churches in Jerusalem. In the personal sense, this was a kind of homecoming for the Apostle Paul. He wasn't from Jerusalem, but if you know about his story, you know that he studied in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. This is where he got his seminary training. This is where he became a scholar and a lawyer. This is where he got his start in ministry among the Jewish people. Paul also has relatives here. The book of Acts tells us about Paul's sister and about a nephew. And so for Paul, this is a kind of homecoming. He hasn't been to Jerusalem in many, many years. The last time he was there, he was on church business and the apostles and the elders worked out some very difficult matters, wrote a letter with the help of the Holy Spirit that went out to all the churches. And Paul and his co-workers delivered that letter to Gentile Christians, to ethnic Christians outside the Jewish community. But now he has a chance to go home. And in this homecoming, you can imagine all of the feelings, all of the range of emotions as he makes this long journey back to Jerusalem. I wonder what went through his mind as along the way he was bidding farewell to so many Christians, some of whom he said he would never see again. There were Christians who warned him that if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested and tied up and bound, and he is going to be handed over to Roman authorities. And so there's a lot of fear, a lot of sorrow in this journey. But if any of you have ever been away from home for a while and made your way back home, you know that there can also be a lot of excitement. There can be a lot of imagination of how things are going to be, reconnecting with old friends, perhaps connecting and telling those stories of your childhood or earlier days all over again. So I imagine Paul feeling all kinds of emotions as he makes his way to Jerusalem. When he gets there, as is often the case with a homecoming, things are not quite what he expected. Today I want to talk to you about taking a calculated risk for the sake of gospel ministry. And I know as well as you that if you are involved in cross-cultural ministry at any level, you know that it's all about taking risks. Anytime you open your mouth with your neighbor, anytime you reach out a lending hand to a friend, anytime you engage with someone who is different than you outside the Christian faith, you are taking calculated risks. And when you're involved in cross-cultural ministry, a lot of your thought a lot of your heart is consumed with how can you who are inside the church take the gospel outside the church and engage with people out in the world. 
Well, today I want you to shift gears a little bit. I want you to shift gears a little bit because the language we use in cross-cultural ministry about becoming all things to all men so that as many as possible might be saved is language that also needs to be applied to insiders, not only outsiders. In this story, we see Paul shifting gears. Just think about this. He has spent his whole ministry, his whole life in Christ, mainly among outsiders, mainly among people who are on the margins of the religious community, people who are very different than his own tradition, people who are very different than his own people, people who are very different than himself. And he has learned along the way how to speak the language of the outsider. More specifically, he's learned how to talk about Jesus and the gospel with people who don't have a religious background. But now he's coming to Jerusalem and he meets with James, the brother of the Lord Jesus. He meets with the elders, the presbytery in Jerusalem. And he has to speak the language of insiders. He gets to use all of his systematic language. He gets to use all of his doctrine and his isms and his ologies. He gets to use the insider language with James and the elders. And they tell him to be very careful how he acts in Jerusalem because all kinds of rumors have been circulating about him. People have been saying all kinds of things about Paul. Some things were true, some things were not true, some things were a mixture of truth and lies. And so James and the presbyters speak to Paul and they want to give him some counsel about how to conduct himself in Jerusalem. Where I'm going with this is they are going to counsel Paul to take a calculated risk for the sake of gospel mission among God's people, among people who are very traditional, people who are very conservative, people who have deep roots in history, people who are in many ways set in their ways. And Paul submits to the brethren and follows their counsel. Paul submits to the brothers and his fathers, and he follows their counsel. Luke has painted for us here a very beautiful picture of the relationship between Paul and James and the elders. Luke says things like, the brothers received us gladly. The elders and James were present and they greeted us. And then they did in this meeting what we do in our presbytery meetings. They shared reports and they let Paul go first. And Paul reported among them all that the gospel of God's grace was doing among the ethnic peoples of the Roman Empire. And he recounts for them the amazing things that God has been doing through his ministry and the response of the Jerusalem Presbytery was to glorify God. They praised God for what God had done in and through Paul. And then it was James's turn to report and James reported how many thousands had come to faith among the Jews. And so he reported what God had been doing in the ministry of the gospel among the Jewish people. And what you find is that in both cases, the reports are consistent, is that when the gospel goes out through messengers, God does amazing things for the life of the world. And so there is great cause for rejoicing in this gathering of the Jerusalem Presbytery. But there's one issue, one concern on the docket, and they want to get this across to Paul now that he has come and he's brought this gift to the churches and he's reported on what God has done. They say, look, keep in mind that 
the many Jews who have come to faith in Christ are still zealous for the law. This did not make them legalists, by the way. This is a way of saying they are zealous for the law and the prophets, the canon of scripture that they had. They love the word of God and they are zealous for it. It's another way of reminding Paul that they're not like the Gentile or ethnic Christians he's been around. They have a long history. They've developed liturgies and practices. They've developed customs and traditions. And Paul is a part of that. That's his heritage. That's his background. And what they say to him is, we want you to be able to prove and to show to your Jewish Christian brothers that you have not rejected them, that you are not sitting in judgment upon them, that you're not criticizing their way of life in Christ. In fact, there is a way that you can show that you are just as much a part of them as you are a part of the ethnic Christians throughout the Roman Empire. And so they come up with some advice. Now, before I get to the advice, I want to talk about the mixture of truth and lies, truth and error that people have been reporting about Paul. And I mention it because this is what James and the elders mentioned to Paul. They said that people have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Why in the world would those rumors be circulating about the Apostle Paul? What had he ever said or done to make people think that he hated Moses or that he hated the Jewish customs or the traditions of his fathers? What led people to that was a misreading of Paul's letters. What led people to that was not listening with charity, was not listening carefully enough to understand the different nuances of his argument and the case he was making for the gospel. So not necessarily to defend his detractors and critics, but to give you some idea of where they were coming from, I want to share with you something, a few things that he wrote in the book of Galatians. One of his earliest letters probably had been circulated outside of Galatia and certainly heard among Jewish Christians in a different way than it was heard among ethnic Christians. These are some things that Paul said in the book of Galatians. Now keep in mind, he's writing to ethnic Christians, but there are Jewish Christians in the mix. And so Paul said things like this. The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be declared righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no, one, no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is no Jew nor Greek. There's no slave nor free. There's no male or female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. Christ. Later in that same letter, Paul said, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is bound to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be declared right with God by the law, you have fallen from grace. And then later in that same letter, Paul says, 
Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So you can see how some of Paul's critics might have thought Paul hates Moses. Paul hates the law. Paul hates circumcision. Conclusion, Paul hates the Jewish people. But keep in mind that Paul was not saying those things to Jewish Christians. He was saying those things to ethnic Christians, Gentile Christians, who were trying to make their way in the cross of Jesus, trying to live by the gospel, trying to live before the face of God as his people. And yet there were some Jewish Christians and there were some non-Christian Jews who were saying, if you want to really and truly be saved, if you want to really and truly get right with God, you must first become a Jew. And then you can get right with God. And Paul was fighting against that. And he was simply echoing what the Jerusalem Council had said in Acts 15. But you know how things go, right? People don't always listen to what you're saying. They don't pay attention to the finer points and they don't read the small print at the bottom of the page. They're not paying attention to Paul's footnotes about the number of times he said, we don't trash the law, we uphold the law. And yet here he finds himself in a difficult situation. In order to get rid of the rumors in order that people will know that there is no truth in these rumors. James and the elders come up with a plan. And the plan is asking Paul to take a calculated risk for the sake of gospel mission. Do therefore what we tell you. They're pleading with him as brothers and fathers in the faith. And they give a plan to him that says, look, we have four men. They are Jewish men who are with us and they have taken a vow to purify themselves. We want you to join with them. Many scholars believe that this was uh, related to the Nazarite vow where men would not cut their hair and not drink wine or grapes or anything to do with grapes for a certain period of time. Then they would cleanse themselves and cut their hair and their vow would be complete. It was a sign that they had devoted themselves totally to the Lord. It's the same kind of thing that John the Baptist lived his life under. And so the rationale here is that if you do this, if you follow our counsel and participate in this vow, then Everyone will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law. And so they're expecting Paul to participate in the Nazarite vow to undergo the cleansing, the ceremonial cleansing and offer sacrifices for these four worshipers. And I can't, I can't tell the difference here. Well, let me say it this way. I don't know what is more shocking. The fact that James and the elders gave this advice to Paul or the fact that Paul said, that's a good idea. I'm going to take that risk. People are all over the map on this. Some people believe that James and the elders gave Paul really bad advice, that they were being too pragmatic, that they were... Consider, considering themselves above Paul. Others think that Paul made too many concessions and that he caved into the pressure and that he did something that he didn't need to do, perhaps even violating his own conscience or contradicting his own gospel. 
But I tend to think in a different way about this. I believe that what Paul was doing is consistent with what he had been doing in his ministry throughout the book of Acts. That he is taking a calculated risk for the sake of gospel mission, which requires him to lay down his own pride, lay down his own ambitions, lay down his own desires for the sake of others. He puts himself in a vulnerable position. Why? Because he loves others more than he loves himself. He loves the gospel more than life itself. And so he puts himself in this precarious situation. Throughout Paul's ministry, he has become all things to all men so that he might win some. He wants to win as many as possible, but he also wants to please the Lord. And so here, depending on how you look at things, you might say this is the worst plan ever. You might say it's not a bad plan, or you might say it's the best plan they had at the time. Either way, these plans are laid in the name of gospel mission for the concern of the peace and unity of the church. And we see Paul bending over backwards to keep the unity and the peace of the church. And what happens? A few days go by and the plan seems to be unfolding nicely. A few days go by and all seems to be well. But just before the plan is completed, some men show up that no one had considered, no one thought they would be there. Men who have traveled just as far as Paul had. Men who had been tracking him down and trying to catch him in different cities and different places throughout the Roman Empire. They show up and they lose their minds because they've seen Paul in the city of Jerusalem with his ethnic friends. They've seen him walking around with non-Jewish people in the city, and then they see him in the temple, and they just assume, wrongly assume, that he has taken non-Jewish people into a Jewish place where it was forbidden for them to go. And they lose their minds. Paul was guilty by association. If you spend any amount of time in cross-cultural ministry, you've been guilty by association. You've been held guilty by association by someone. People assume the worst about you at times rather than the best. But I want to point out here that for the few days after the plan was put in place, that none of the Jewish Christians were concerned about Paul. None of the Jewish Christian leaders were concerned about Paul. They were delighted to have him among them. They were delighted to hear what God had been doing in him and through his ministry. So who are these critics? These critics are not Jewish Christians. These are Jewish critics. Jewish critics who have come from outside the presbytery, who have come from outside of this community and they began to stir up the old stories about Paul that were not true and just as it was in the days of Jesus when the chief priests and the leaders of the people stirred up the crowds against Jesus so this group of critics stirred up the crowd against Paul notice what they said I'm skipping ahead a little bit but they said, men of Israel, help! They're crying for help. This is desperation. They cry for help because they want everyone on their side to grab hold of Paul. And they bring up those accusations. He's been teaching everyone, everywhere, against the people and, and the law and this place. None of these things were true. None of those accusations were rooted and grounded in reality. But all it takes is a few critics with loud voices to stir up trouble against gospel ministry. And guess what happens? The whole world turned against them. 
What do we see happening here? We see happening here what we've seen happen perhaps in our own experiences. That God is working through the preaching of the gospel among diverse people groups. He's doing remarkable things and causing many to glorify the name of Jesus and rejoice in the work of the gospel. And all it takes is a few critics stirring up controversy to bring the house down. And here, these spin doctors have blown everything out of proportion. And they come for Paul. He's guilty by association. They arrest him. And Luke tells us they were seeking to kill him. And word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. These guys knew how to stir up trouble. They knew how to make a mess of things. Does this mean that we should not take calculated risks for the sake of gospel mission? Not at all. It simply tells us that even the best missional plans can blow up in our face. Even the things that we hope to and hope and desire to accomplish for the gospel of grace sometimes do not fully materialize or come to fruition in the time and in the moment in which we expect. But if I could just flash a little bit of lightning before the thunder comes in the next couple of weeks, I want you to know that since James and the presbyters and Paul took this calculated risk for gospel mission, God was able to do far more than they could ever ask or imagine, even through this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad circumstance. For Paul was elevated by God to a platform where he could preach the gospel to Jews and to Greeks, to Romans, to slaves and to free. He could preach the gospel to kings and to prisoners. He was put in a place through this series of circumstances as God's invisible providential hand moved him through the storyline. He was put in a place where he could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to far more people than he could ever ask or imagine. And so I want to encourage you, take your calculated risks for the sake of gospel mission. But as you do so, be very careful to keep a few things in mind. Be very careful to keep a few things in mind. First thing you should keep in mind as you take this calculated risk for the sake of gospel mission is evangelical truth. I don't mean evangelical in contrast to Catholic or uh, Greek Orthodox or something like that. I mean evangelical in the sense the gospel-oriented, gospel-centered truth. Keep the message of the cross, Jesus Christ crucified, central and foundational to your cross-cultural ministry. Secondly, never lose sight of pastoral concern. Pastoral concern. Consider others. Consider insiders and outsiders. Consider how you speak to insiders and outsiders and what kind of language, what kind of tone, what kind of approach you take to insiders and outsiders. To the Jew, become a Jew. To the Greek, become a Greek. To win both. To the conservative, become conservative. To the progressive, become progressive. To win both with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Consider the needs of the rich and the poor. Consider the experiences of the red, the yellow, the black and the white. 
enter into those stories with pastoral concern. How can you serve others? How can you best reach them and communicate the love and the mercy and the grace of God in Christ to them? This is real pastoral concern. And keep in mind, spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline. Paul describes himself in this way that when he runs, he does not run aimlessly. There's no chaos and spontaneity driving his ministry. He is running and competing according to the rules set forth by the word of God. He is training and disciplining himself so that he will not be disqualified from the race. But he wants to compete in order to win. It's not enough just to compete. It's certainly not enough just to train. But you want to train and compete in order to win. And he's not simply thinking of winning for himself. It's not just about how he might gain the crown for himself but he wants those with whom he has served and loved, those whom he has discipled and brought to faith in Christ to win the victory of crown in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And then the last thing I would encourage you to keep in mind is your missional purpose, your missional purpose. Remember, you are trying to save as many as possible. And you are trying to please the Lord as you do so. So it's not a matter of choosing one over the other. It's both and. We want to please the Lord, but we want to save as many as possible. What you win them with is what you win them to. If you win them with Christ crucified, you've won them to Christ crucified. So don't lose sight of this missional purpose. Well, as you know, the Lord sends us a variety of gifts. Often in preaching, it's difficult to find the right illustrations or the right words to say as you communicate the gospel to people. And it just so happened that this week I was given a gift in By Faith magazine and the article that features in the magazine. And as I conclude this message, I want to conclude by echoing the words of our stated clerk, Roy Taylor, who asks in this article, or at least observes in this article, some things that are very important to us and for us as a denomination, very important to Mosaic as a cross-cultural church, very important to me as a pastor serving in North Texas. As we consider the future, as we consider where we are and how to move out with the gospel and advance the gospel in our corner of the world, hear these words from Roy Taylor, who says, A temptation for conservative groups is to refight the battles of the past and constantly to compare themselves with the groups out of which they have come. Another temptation is to focus on the past rather than the future. This is a particular temptation for Presbyterian Reformed folks because we have such a rich theological heritage. He goes on to note that nostalgia is seeking to live in the past or recreate the past. Nostalgia is crippling. History is learning from the past in order to shape the future. History is inspiring. The purpose of the PCA should not be to try to relive ministry as it was a past century ago. Our purpose should be to learn from our past shortcomings and advances in order to minister effectively in the present and the future. Amen and amen. What I want you to see in summary is that the Apostle Paul, in going to Jerusalem, in many ways was going back to the past. But in going back to the past, he was also going back to the future. He went back to the past in the sense that he gave a head nod. He gave respect to his heritage. He did everything he could to honor his father and mother. He did what he could to respect 
the traditions of his people, to live according to their customs, to show them no harm, to honor them and lift them up. But he also had to live with the tension of knowing that the way forward was not going back to becoming more and more Jewish. The way forward was to carry the cross into the future, was to let the cross of Jesus Christ begin to shape the life and the liturgy and the mission of God's people. And he found himself living in that tension. That's where we are as well. But we can live in that tension with all the good intentions of honoring the Lord Jesus Christ and doing all the good we can for the church, for those in the culture, for those who are yet to come into the church. And I hope and pray that we will do this together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.